I remember seeing what looked like 10 tonne of metal heading for me. Unfortunately, stopped and out two feet from my face. I felt like I was being sucked into the carriage behind me and um, all the, the luggage rails and everything came towards my face and I just bent over um, and there was a loud crash. Everything seemed to be chaotic and next minute I knew that I was just being pin pinned up between the actual two, between two seats together with two other chaps. Um, both of us actually crushed by, by our legs. The commuters were going past and I was screaming at that point, look, you know, get, can someone come in and try and lever this, this weight off me? But um, they, they leaned in and just said, look, the fire brigade are coming. You know, just hold on, just hold on. January the 8th, 1991, Cannon Street Station. Train run into buses. Five persons confirmed flat. Unknown amount of persons injured. Make ETs two. Off to that one, over. It was soon apparent this was a major incident. Twelve doctors, 60 firefighters and 100 ambulance personnel were called out. No single emergency service was in charge, but as at all major incidents there were set procedures to follow. Firefighters, trained in emergency rescue, release trapped passengers. The doctors give immediate medical attention. Ambulance staff help to stabilise casualties and ferry many of the 270 injured passengers to hospital. The train hit these buffers at 10 miles per hour, more than twice the speed they can absorb. The resulting shockwave of energy passed down the train, causing distortion to carriages 1 and 2, but devastation to carriages 5 and 6. The underframe of carriage five punched through the body of carriage six, pushing passengers towards the back of the train and trapping 15 people here in carriage six. Some passengers in carriage six found their legs tangled in the wreckage of carriage five. Others found their legs had gone through the underframe. Under the train, firefighters were jacking up metal, millimetre by millimetre. Inside carriage six, firefighters only had room to work with hacksaws, pen knives and bare hands to try and release the commuters. Well, the scene to the untrained, I suppose, comes across as total chaos um, because there is so much going on. Um, you can hardly get on the platform. You couldn't get on the train but for literally forcing yourself on. It probably took me maybe the best part of five minutes to actually get into the middle of the casualties. Um, there wasn't room to stand, you had to make room to get your legs in a hole somewhere and stand. Um, and then it probably took me another five to ten minutes to make an appraisal of that situation, because it's like a jigsaw puzzle, um, or that situation was. You had so many casualties there, um, they're all trapping each other, they're all holding each other down, but they're all in their own way trapped with the metal framework of the carriages. You have to have a feel around what's trapped and where they're trapped um, by sliding your hand down, hands down and around their legs. Trying to actually make a visual check, which is of course very difficult, um, because there wasn't room to stand, let alone get down and leg on the floor. In carriage six, 15 passengers were jammed together in a space eight and a half feet by four feet and trapped by twisted metal. 
Helen Croxford was in the middle, Matt Roberts and Stephen Haynes were on the platform side. The side of carriage six was cut out to make space for the emergency services. Stephen Haynes, his legs trapped, was held up by a construction manager from a nearby building site. The manager also supported Matt Roberts while firefighters searched under the train for ways of forcing apart the metal wreckage. They were trying to jack the train up and the debris of the two carriages to bring them apart in some way. The problem was that every time they moved something, it hurt someone somewhere and they'd have to stop. And that went on a long time like that. It was getting very frustrating because if, if they managed to move something and I felt pressure come off my knees and I was thinking, oh, good, I'll be out in a minute, someone else to my left or what have you would, would be screaming and saying it's hurting their legs, it puts pressure on. This time it was Stephen Haynes who felt the pain as firefighters moved a small piece of the underframe. I was actually trapped for around about uh, three hours. Um, the actual surgeons here have actually stated that up to, uh, for around about four hours the muscle, muscle, um, actual muscle tissue starts to uh, die off, which may, which mean you may actually lose a limb or you may obviously severe disabilities in those limbs in future life. So obviously they they realise. They realise these problems and they realise that they, they have the time is, isn't on their side, that they've, they've got to work quickly. It was very hot in there. I'd had my tie removed and my shirt was unbuttoned down to my waist and my coat had been pulled off the left shoulder. Um, and we were all asking for drinks of water. And they were very sparing with water, for the obvious reason that they don't know if you're going to have to undergo any sort of surgery. So they make sure you just have a very small drink. And I told them, a few times to hurry up, in strong terms, because I was very worried about my legs, because by which time I couldn't feel them anymore, which in one way was a blessing, because I couldn't feel the pain below my knees, but in the other way, the, one of the last sensations I'd had was that I was bleeding, and I didn't know if I was losing a lot of blood, and presumably my circulation had been cut off, and that's why I couldn't feel them, and I didn't know how long I could be like that without permanent damage being done. I was a little bit wary, about them giving me anything, either intravenously or with a mask, because one feeling was I just wanted to pass out and wake up and find myself in the hospital and it would all be over. But then I was frightened that if I wasn't conscious, what they might do to my legs to get me out. My right leg was trapped by the, by the seats opposite me and my left leg was trapped. It went through the carriage behind me, through the grills, the heating grills, and into the carriage behind me. I saw the fireman look at the, look to a fireman behind me and he gave him a funny glare, you know, as if there was something like quite wrong with my leg. Um, and I could feel blood trickling down my leg as well. I knew, I, knew I couldn't move it. Um, and I just thought, you know, I kept on asking them, are you going to amputate it? If you are, let me know, you know. I thought because, you know, I watched London's Burning and I thought, you know, they did it on there um, and they amputated the girl's leg on there that they were going to do it here because, I mean, it looked like it was exactly the same sort of situation. So they said, that they, one of the firemen said to me, look, I'm not, a, not an actor, I'm a fireman. <laughs> Eventually, Helen Croxford was released after firefighters under the train jacked up more metal and others inside used hydraulic spreaders to force a gap in the steelwork. But the firefighter Helen remembers most clearly is the one who finally lifted her free. One fireman sort of literally pulled me out. I think he fell over actually with the weight. <laughs> but um, I got out that way. He came in to see me last week. He's, um, his name's Mick Batchelor um, and he's from Houston. You know, and I'm really grateful to him. <laughs> my bone came through my, my leg. I had 16 stitches in my left leg, which was one that was trapped and went through the other carriage. And I broke my fibula and my tibia three times. 
I've had my leg contraction for the past two weeks, which was quite painful. And um, then they plastered it sort of a couple of days ago. They've kept the actual pin that's going through my, my ankle there. Um, and they'll take that out in two weeks. I have the class on for about six to eight weeks, maybe longer. She's now been told her leg will be in plaster for at least three more months. Once Helen was out, firefighters slowly eased the wreckage away from Stephen Haynes's legs. I was actually gassed towards the end, but I believe they actually lowered the seat that I was, um, my back was against, and gently lowered it and pivoted it out. That's as much as I actually remember, besides under the gas, I felt a very large yank on my leg, a throbbing pain, which then subsided quickly. Um, and then I was free, I was out. My words to the actual ambulance when was, I, so I was pretty keen sportsman. The first thing I, I just said to him, I said, well, I want you to be honest with me, have I got both my legs? And he looked at me and said, of course you've got both your legs. And I, I just cried. And it's, I was just so relieved and so joyous. Stephen has largely recovered from his injuries. Fortunately, firefighters released his crushed legs before they were permanently damaged. They were very quick, very proficient, and they were very, very good. And I think what they do as a job is remarkable, and I'm sure they go through a lot of mental, mental pressure themselves. I mean, they are always the first on, on a scene like this. They're always going to see the, the true horrors. Uh, full credit to them. Now the firefighters had room to free Matt Roberts. They moved something and I felt the pressure come off my knees and I felt feeling rush back into my legs and I could feel my toes. And at that stage, I was aware of them taking my shoe off of one of my feet and also what felt like someone prodding my feet with a, with a finger. And I was very anxiously telling them that I could feel them doing it because I had this feeling, this overriding fear that they may be thinking of taking my legs off to get me out. And I wanted them to know that I could still feel, I had feeling there. I had a few tears when I got me out on the platform, just, just out of relief. Just a relief to be out, and also that I think fairly straight away, to me, it became apparent that my injuries weren't as bad as perhaps I feared because I was lying on a stretch of wiggling my toes. And uh, I was also relieved to see that the bottom of my trousers didn't appear to have blood on them, my socks and feet were covered in blood. But this sensation I'd had earlier of blood running down my legs, it, my trousers weren't stained. Um, so I hadn't apparently lost that much blood. Throughout their ordeal, passengers received constant medical attention. The most seriously trapped passenger was Paul Chaplin, at the front right of compartment six. Paul was slumped forward over the folded metal wall of carriage five, his broken and crushed arm entangled in a door frame. The fireman who, who was with me, uh, it was Mick Batchelor. He, he, he was all crunched over uh, all the time I stood with, with me. I don't think I actually realised how small a space I was, uh, I was in. And you got to know Mick Batchelor quite well, did you, in those few hours? He was the guy who held on to my hand. Just, he basically said, look, just, just keep squeezing my hand, let me know you're still conscious every so often. But that, I felt then that, you know, that's it. So I, I just tried to just turn off and try to keep us just like on a tick over. The way he was laying, he was laying over the back of the seat with his arm in sort of a Z position, trapped underneath um, side of the carriage door, it looked like. Um, but basically, we had, what we did was to lift, cut, spread, just to get, get as much relief off the guy's arm as possible, because obviously he was in a lot of pain. He was, um, for want of a better word, a very brave man. I mean, because there were people there with far less injuries, was making a lot more bloody noise than him. And he was, he was a very, very brave man. And I like, not admire him for what he'd done, because I would not like to be in that situation myself. Paul had now been trapped for over three hours. With Paul, really, all, all I was involved with was holding his legs up, because um, he was sort of up quite high, sort of head height, and his legs were hanging down. So me and a, another fireman, but the, uh, the surgeon wanted us to just lift him so he was straight. So really, we just had his legs on our shoulders while the guy's up top worked on his arm. I, I heard someone say, look, we've got to get this guy out. And I was sort of put two and two together and figured, look, you know, they, they obviously mean they're going to do something drastic, and that was to cut my arm off. 
So I sort of burst from underneath the coat and said, no, no way. And Mick Batchelor said, no, 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 no give us, you know, we'll, we'll get you out, don't worry. And I think he said, give us uh, another 10 minutes and, uh, and then we'll let you have him. As the senior uh, uh, doctor of the mobile medical team, I wasn't having any amputations done unless I actually seen what was going on. And it was uh, clear that with a combined effort, this could be released, and that would not have been the right course of action. But the firefighters couldn't release Paul without endangering passengers trapped in carriage five, the carriage in front. The severity of the crash had resulted in carriages five and six becoming intricately entangled. Attempts to jack up the metal debris in either carriage jeopardized the remaining casualties. Inside carriage five, three people were trapped. Two women, sitting side by side facing the rear of the train, were pinned down by a male casualty thrown across their bodies and by the metal wall of the compartment which had crashed down on them. I was strapped from the waist down. Um, I had something leaning on my chest which made it difficult to breathe. Um, but my legs were completely trapped and my arms were trapped as well. Um, so I could only move from my, my neck upwards. Uh, two girls that were under uh, a bulkhead, but on top of the bulkhead, of course, we had other people trapped uh, in, in the carriage behind. So uh, clearly what had to be done was, it wasn't just a matter of lifting up on, on our side, otherwise the people on top would have suffered, uh, and vice versa. It wasn't a matter of, of, of spreading on top, because every time anything moved on top, uh, our girls were actually feeling that as well. So uh, there was a very complex situation which had to be um, worked out, and that requires thought as well as just activity. The fire service was superb in the way that they uh, were able to lift um, in a controlled fashion and take down the side of the train in a controlled fashion and then jack up bit by bit and block up the, uh, um, the piece of carriage. I got the feeling that it was all under control. Everybody knew that they had a job to do and they were all just getting on with that job. There was no panic on, on the part of any of the emergency services at all. They, um, they were very calm, very reassuring and we're, we're talking us through it step by step. Um, and although they kept saying, don't worry, we'll get you out, you'll be out in 10 minutes, you'll be out in quarter an hour, whatever, um, that was very reassuring at the time. The male casualty in carriage five died before being released. Once he was removed, the firefighters were able to slide out one of the women who'd been pinned under his body. She suffered internal injuries and one of her legs was crushed. Only Janet McGonagall was now left in carriage five. And I remember the seat being lowered down um, and being pulled out um, forcefully from, from the shoulders, um, put on a stretcher and um, carried across the, the compartment. I feared that Certainly my left foot might have to be amputated because I couldn't see how on earth they were ever going to remove my foot from underneath so much metal. And that was my worst fear. And even when, I, when they released me, I asked one of the crew, did I still have my left foot? Because I, I couldn't feel anything. And I wondered whether it was still there. And one of them said, yes, you've definitely got 10 toes. Janet still walked with a limp six months after the accident. With all the passengers removed from carriage five, the firefighters were able to wrench away the debris which trapped the last and most seriously injured casualty, Paul Chaplin. He had quite considerable um, uh, discomfort and pain, and he, though the rest of us obviously get very hot uh, working in this sort of environment, uh, the poor patient is the one that gets cold, and um, one of the first things that I think you would have uh, seen would have been we were trying to put on a, a space blanket. But as well as that, it was important also to 
uh, restore the straightness of his arm um, and establish a pulse again. And indeed, that happened immediately. I was eased down onto this uh, bogey, like a small, small train affair. And then they, they pushed me along on the track out towards Cannon Street Bridge, where there was a helicopter. As I was going along, uh, I don't know, I think it either bumped on someone's foot or something or other, and anything, uh, any bump cause, if someone's injured, it's going to cause uh, upset. And so I think I let out an ouch at that point. I'm not sure if it ran over someone's foot. We thrive on other people's misfortunes, whether it be fires or special services like that. That's what we we love them. And that sounds wrong to other people, but that's what we're waiting for. That's our job, something to get stuck into. You can just take it there. Paul, we're just going to lift your arm and pop a dressing on it, all right? Hold still for us. Well done. Right, apart from your arm, yeah. have you got any pain anywhere else? No. Not at all. Right, you haven't got any pain in your tummy at all? Breathing, right. The fire service and the ambulance service and the medical teams that I was involved with worked together uh, better as a team than I have ever encountered before. And that, I think, is a tremendous commendation. All the doctors uh, are very positive about it. They're telling me that uh, once the swelling goes down, I'll start to get more movement in the fingers and arm. Uh, I've got, I can feel, I can get touched now, so that's good. And it's, they say it should come back.